This is Big Ideas from the ABC. Uh, welcome to uh, this special debate tonight on behalf of the St James Ethics Centre, the Sydney Morning Herald, AMP, the City of Sydney and the ABC. I welcome you to the City Recital Hall, Angel Place, for this third debate for 2011. Now, the first two debates have been very lively indeed, and uh, I think tonight's debate looks equally promising. I would like uh, right away to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on whose country we meet today, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders. My name is Geraldine Doog, and I'm delighted to chair tonight's debate in Simon Longstaff's absence. And uh, the topic, our topic tonight, if we keep populating, we will perish. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers. Uh, each of you has been on your order paper. You've been given the briefest of outlines of these uh, remarkable people whose lives sort of uh, take one's breath away in terms of how much they manage to fit in. The uh, IQ2 Oz website provides more information, though um, I, I think even those summaries do little justice to the lives as lived by our special guests tonight. All lives very much underway, if, if you see what I mean, which is, I think, a great compliment to them all. So I'd like to introduce on the four sides, so uh, supporting the motion, if we keep populating, we will perish, Dick Smith. Uh, Dick is a businessman, an entrepreneur, an adventurer. He's a philanthropist. He's had the honour of being named one of Australia's living treasures by the National Trust in 2005. He talks and travels widely all over the country. He's never shy of taking on difficult topics and is a passionate advocate for the environment. His latest interest lies, as you will hear, in initiating a great debate on what he sees as Australia's addiction to population and economic growth. And he says he's uh, spurred, or he's sparked in this, by the future that he suspects his grandchildren will face. Senator-elect Larissa Waters is the first Green Senator for Queensland, and she took office this month. She's an environmental lawyer who's provided advice on using the law to protect the environment. She was named Australian Young Environmental Lawyer for 2010 by the Law Council of Australia. And in the Senate, she plans to move amendments to federal laws to better protect the reef, to promote renewable energy, and to protect good quality agricultural land from incompatible land uses. And Professor Steve Keane is Associate Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Western Sydney. He was one of the handful of economists to warn of the impending global financial crisis as early as December 2005. So he really can be a little proud of that. He won the Revere Award, in fact, for being the economist whose work is most likely to prevent a future financial crisis. And uh, his communication skills, he tells us, were honed in his pre-academic career, a very multi-talented career, which included stints as a school librarian, as an education officer for an NGO, as a conference organiser, computer programmer, journalist for the computer press, and economic commentator for ABC Radio National and Radio Australia. So there's a, a very good, broad suite of skills there. Now, against the motion, if we keep populating, we will perish, Father Frank Brennan. Frank is a Jesuit priest. He's an adjunct fellow in the Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies at the ANU. He's professor of law at the Institute of Legal Studies at the Australian Catholic University. And he's professor of human rights and social justice at the University of Notre Dame in Australia. He was the founding director of UNIA, which is the Australian Jesuit Social Justice Centre. He returned to Australia in 2005 from a fellowship at Boston College, and I think is widely known uh, for his writing and his commentating. Wayne Goss was Premier of Queensland from 1989 till 1996, having worked as a solicitor before he entered politics in 1983. He's currently chairman of Deloitte Australia, Osenko Limited, and Free TV Australia Limited. He's an ambassador for the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation. He's been awarded honorary doctorates of the university from the QUT, Queensland University of Technology, Griffith University, and the University of Queensland. And Dr. Tanvir Ahmed is a psychiatrist and opinion columnist for the Sydney Morning Herald. 
He often writes, as you may have read of late, about immigration and multiculturalism and broader matters as well. He's a former foreign affairs journalist for SBS and his first book, The Exotic Rissole, <laughs> will be published in October of this year. Maybe I'll line him up right now for my program. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome all our special speakers tonight. So we're in for a treat. Um, I will resume my seat at the back here and keep very conscious time. And I will invite the first speaker for the affirmative, Dick Smith, to address us now for nine minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Keep populating. Well, obviously, this statement is referring to our present system of exponential growth in population. We all know the facts. It took 10, over 10,000 years to get to 1 billion. Now, every 16 years, we get another billion, 80 million a year increase. The growth pattern is now almost, it's completely vertical. And it's not 9 billion anymore. The United Nations says we're going to go to 10 billion. If Australia grows at the record rate we did the year before last, 2.1% means our population doubles every 30 years. 100 million by the end of this century, 1 billion in 220 years, the time of modern Australia. This is totally ridiculous. Everyone knows you can't have growth forever. Why do we delude ourselves? It's all about misleading each other. Even the people who are pro-growth will admit that, of course, it has to stop one day. We just can't keep populating forever. What, a trillion, trillion in Australia, one square inch for every person? Impossible. So what we're basically discussing is, when will the growth stop? Say, during a generation that will plan for it? Or what do we shirk our responsibility and let our kids or grandchildren solve the problem? We're addicted to growth. There's no evidence that we'll sacrifice now for something that may or may not happen. When Churchill warned that Hitler should be held to account to international law, most people said, oh, well, we don't really know if something will go wrong. And that one mistake resulted in over 60 million people losing their lives. I think it's a bit similar with climate change now, where we all say, oh, those climate change scientists say there's a 10% chance they could be wrong. Let's take the chance, because it doesn't affect us, it'll affect future generations. It's not just the impossibility of perpetual growth in population. It's our economic system that's based on perpetual growth in the use of energy and resources. Fewer game to say. Now, I wrote this book, Dick Smith's Population Crisis, The Dangers of Sustainable Growth for Australia. It's the greatest flop in Australian publishing history. Conveniently, <laughs> I've got a rubbish bin here. Look at that. You can get these for nothing, the greatest <laughs> flop. It's interesting, my wife went down to Dimmick's to buy one of the books, and there on the front counter was The Big Tilt by KMG demographer Bernard Salt, spruiking up growth and selling thousands of books. When she asked for my book, it was a bit like that ad for the St George Bank where someone mentioned at the barbecue that he was a banker and there was just complete silence. She eventually got one of my books from out the back in a brown paper cover. <laughs> because business doesn't want to mention that growth is not sustainable. It's, it's interesting. I happen to believe that we could actually have 100 million people in Australia. We could have five Dubais between Brisbane and uh, Cairns. Rupert Murdoch wrote to me and said, well, Dick, I think 100 million might be too many, but who knows, there's a lot of growth left. Of course, he would say that. But here's the problem. If you go to 100 million, it's great for the wealthy because there are more consumers, for people like me, to make more money. But what about typical Aussies? I think we've either gone past the sweet point or we're close to it. It's interesting, for the first time, our gross domestic product per head is more than that of the USA. People say, if we had 300 million like the USA, we'd be wealthier. Well, the wealthy would be wealthier, but typical Australians would be less well-off because you're spreading the finite cake among more people. Now, you have to be completely devoid of common sense 
or a mainstream economist not to accept that perpetual growth is impossible. It's just like perpetual motion machines. Even if it's true, surely we're completely wasting our time having this debate because it's obvious we're not going to do anything about it until we run off the cliff or hit the wall. I wrote to Cardinal Pell and I said, Cardinal, what's your view about 9 billion going to 10 billion? He wrote back to me and he said, Dick, you're wrong. The problem is there's not going to be enough people in the world. When we get to 10 billion, it's going to start dropping off. And in my book, I cover the fact, hold on, just throw a few more away, <laughs> that the official doctrine of the Catholic Church decrees, inverted commas, the intrinsic evil of contraception. It is held to be definitive and irreformable. Now, it's interesting because in Italy, it has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world, 1.39, way below replacement level, sensible mothers in Italy, right? Maybe there's no Catholics there, I don't know. In the Philippines, where the church retains its, auto its authority, the fertility rate is 3.03. .03. It's an absolute catastrophe. Backyard abortions are on the increase, one of the few countries in the world. It's the highest for decades. One in six end up with horrific complications and death. Man's inhumanity to man is incredible. Now, it's interesting. We already have one billion people hungry in this world while the other side will be spruiking growth. I asked Bob Brown two years ago, why isn't the Greens strong or have a strong policy on population? And he said, Dick, two reasons. The Murdoch press, he said, they'll constantly attack us if we don't support growth. And he said also, people will be called racist if you mention growth. First of all, let's look at the Murdoch press, totally addicted to growth. They have one responsibility to improve the return to their shareholders. No one links the present problems in the UK with this constant pressure for growth. Imagine the staff of News Limited, how can we get growth? How can we get more people to buy our products? We've got to get more people in the population. The racism claims are interesting. They're prob mainly used to stop people from saying that e exponential growth is impossible. Personally, I'd like to see our population stabilise. I'm a disciple of the Labor backbencher, Kevin Thompson. I'd like to see our net immigration be about 75,000 per annum, which is still very high by international standards. I'd love to see a substantial increase in our humanitarian intake. Borders are never fair, but it would be good if we could make them a little fairer. Now, we can have a fantastic economic system without perpetual growth in consumption and resources and a stable population. Hold on, just throw a few more of those books away. Ladies and gentlemen, if we keep populating, that is to keep exponentially increasing our population, our human civilization as we know it today will undoubtedly collapse. Are we to be like locusts that breed in billions and then perish in billions? Or could we copy the Aboriginal Yaiora civilization that was mentioned at the start? It lived in this continent for tens of thousands of years, sustainably and with a stable population. I hope it's the latter. Thank you. And the first speaker for the negative, Frank Brennan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great to be with you. You might remember the old poem, we'll all be ruined, said Henrahan. Why would we be ruined? Well, it would vary from season to season, rain, drought or snow. But tonight, we're to be told by our opponents, no, it's simple, we'll all be ruined. Why? Because there's too many of us. The recent Australian survey of social attitudes asked the question, do you think Australia needs more people? 72% answered no, so I presume that reflects the audience here tonight. So, I and my colleagues, we have an uphill battle. But I don't think the relevant question is about needing more people. What we'll be putting to you tonight is that there's a certain reality that we're going to confront. And can we be sensible as we approach the issue of population? 
For our side, we don't believe that the world is at any significant risk of buckling under the sheer weight of population numbers, but we don't have to prove that, because even if it were, we don't believe there's anything significant Australia could do to reduce the risk of that buckling. See, we've already heard from Dick, this argument, it works on two levels. There's discussion about the inevitable increase in world population, which will go from 7 to 9.3 billion by that magical year, 2050. But then there's the question about what will be our sustainable population here in Australia. On our side, we're quite happy at the idea that Australia will be sustainable with a population of about 36 million in 2050. We think you can be smart about that and we think you can be humane about that. You see, the problem with this two-aspect debate, it's a little as if we were to be told that at the end of the night, this auditorium is going to be filled to overflowing. But up here on the stage, there's not going to be any change. Unlike you in the auditorium, you in the globe out there, we up here on the stage in Australia, we have control. And at the moment, we have seven people up here, and we're going to be allowed to decide whether at the end of the night we'll have eight or nine people up here, or five or six people up here. But there's still going to be an auditorium which is teeming with people out there. I think both sides are agreed. There's next to nothing we can do about that teeming of the world's population. And yet we, living in the island nation continent we do, we focus increasingly on what's going to be the state of this stage. Five people, nine people, whatever. So, having set that global backdrop, I'd like to consider a little more dispassionately what are the issues that contribute to deciding how many to have on this stage. Questions about fertility, ageing, net overseas migration. And then from Wayne, someone who's been a Premier, a business consultant, hearing about the present boom and how we can be smart in adapting to that with a realistic population policy. And then from Tanvir himself, a migrant from Bangladesh, now a psychiatrist just back from doing his service in Armidale, outback regional Australia this very day, how immigrants contribute so much to the aggregate of ideas in this country. And so our argument to you tonight is that indeed there will be inevitable increases in population in the world. Yes, we in Australia do have more control over some matters, but let's now look at what we do control. Why we're in a privileged situation in Australia is, of course, that we now have a very educated population. And as great writers like Amartya Sen have made very clear, what contributes most on arguments about fertility is the education and the availability of work for the women in your society. And what we do know is that 42% of the world's population live in low fertility countries like Australia. And we're not going to be contributing significantly to that vast increase in the world population which is to confront us by the end of this coming century. If we look at our fertility rates here in Australia, they're still at less than replacement level. But we are an ageing society. We're such an ageing society that we know that the number of people who will be in a situation to be working in order to support the aged, that that percentage is changing adversely for us all the time. And how can we respond to that? Well, it's not going to be by increasing fertility very greatly, but with migration, we can address something of that question. Let's consider what we do with migration. If our opponents are seriously to say that we want to cut back the Australian population, which aspect of our migration policy would they cut back? Would it be the family reunion? On what basis would we do that, given the strict criteria that already apply for Australian citizens to exercise that basic human right to be able to sponsor, at their expense, people to become part of this society? 
so presumably it won't be that. Given the resources boom that we're enjoying at the moment, surely they are not going to seriously suggest that we would cut our skills migration program at the very time that we need that in order not only that we can look to our own needs, but so we can be of greater service to the international community. And surely above all, there is no way that they would want to cut our humanitarian program. Yes, whatever grievances we might have about the Malaysian solution, which was announced yesterday by the government, no matter what our politics, I would hope all decent Australians would say, yes, the fact that we're going to increase our humanitarian quota to 14,750, we think we're at least big enough to be able to do that. And so, would they be cutting that? I presume not. Well, if there's not going to be a cut in migration, and if fertility is going to remain basically as it is, what then is the other solution? Well, we do have an ageing population, you might say, and with the breakthroughs in medical technology, it's expected that the ageing of our population will continue. Given that, what is to be the way forward to the future? The proportion of working age people in Australia is projected to fall, with only 2.7 people of working age to support each Australian age 65 and over by the year 2050. Compared with the moment, five working age people per age person today and 7.5 in 1970. This is not to instill fear into our hearts. It's to say, look how cleverly, look how smartly, look how humanely we adapted as a society between 1970 and now. In 1970, there were 7.5 people in the workforce who could contribute to the needs of Australians aged over 65 years. That now has reduced to five. And yes, it will now halve again to 2.7. These are the challenges which are before us. And thus, what I put to you at the end of the night is that when you listen to the views, whether it be of someone like Tim Flannery saying that the maximum this stage can hold is figuratively 6 to 12 million, or whether it be Dick and his colleagues who won't put a figure on it, but say they want to cut it, but somehow we don't hear how, let's remember the two great moral challenges are the auditoriums going to be overflowing at the end of the night, and the question is going to be how we can smartly contribute to life on this stage and to assisting those of you there in the swelling auditorium. Thank you. Second speaker for the affirmative, Larissa Waters. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to start by adding my acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, and I'm afraid as a lawyer and a politician, I'm not going to be funny at all. So uh, forgive me for that. But I am proud to be a member of a parliamentary political party which has a population policy, and I believe we're still the only ones. So a key aspect of that policy is that the Greens believe the planet simply cannot support 9.2 billion people by 2050, and that global population growth is a global problem that requires a global solution. But Australia needs to play its part in that. The Greens have been advocating for Australia's overseas aid budget to be increased to 0.7% of GNP, as the UN has suggested with a focus on funding for literacy and reproductive health programs for women and girls. Now, such programs empower women globally and they give them a brighter future and they give them the chance to control their own reproductive future and that's a really important social justice issue. Uh, and it is a shame that there's only one woman on the panel tonight. But the Greens also believe that Australia's fragile environment cannot sustainably support the projected 36 billion people by 2050. Nationally, our current population growth is outstripping our infrastructure, our quality of life 
and our environmental limits. We think that our population size should be at a level to ensure the protection of quality of life and the environment. Now that should entail a rethink of the levels of skilled migration, which has quadrupled in the past decade. But humanitarian intake, of course, hasn't gone anywhere. Now I think it would be a much more compassionate approach to share this nation's prosperity with people who really need it, like asylum seekers and of course climate refugees, which we're gonna see an awful lot of, and focus on increasing the skills of Australians and particularly young Australians to fill those skill shortages. So with that said, tonight I've got the task of convincing you that if we populate, keep populating, we will perish. So I'm going to start local and then go global. Uh, now I come from South East Queensland, which until very recently was the fastest growing region of Australia. Uh, now Wayne may disagree with me, but Queensland is still a developer's paradise. And there's a growth is good at all costs mentality that still pervades. And that ignores the ecological reality of limits to growth. Now our region's growth rate is threatening our environment and it's pushing our infrastructure to its limits. Until very recently we were in drastic drought with no sustainable water supply. Affordable housing is a thing of the past. Our roads are clogged and our public hospital waiting lists are immense. But closest to my heart, South East Queensland's growth is causing our biodiversity to rapidly decline. Now, the number of koalas in Queensland, which was once estimated to be in the millions, is now thought to be 25 to 30,000 in the southeast bioregion, with as few as 500 koalas in the Koala Coast, the so-called Koala Coast region of the Redlands. Uh, well, the experts are saying that by 2020, there may not be any koalas in the Koala Coast, so perhaps it'll just be the coast. Now, I don't think that we have a right to let our development addiction, our growth fetish, determine the fate of other species uh, and end their fate. So it's, on, it's that focus on other species, this planet's glorious biodiversity, that I want to focus on tonight. Uh, now, you may know Australia has been declared one of the 17 most biodiverse countries in the world. We're, in fact, considered mega biodiverse, which is a bit of a mouthful. Carrying this planet's richness, that, that brings a special responsibility for us. Uh, and we've got a very high rate of species that are only found here. Now, of course, most people know of our marsupials and our monotremes, but less well known are the richness of reptiles, fungi, lichen, and even ants. Uh, now, you probably don't know that uh, a hill in Canberra has more species of ants than the whole of Great Britain. Uh, but there's not to be any jokes about Capitol Hill, and I'm certainly not likening politicians to ants. <laughs> The most biodiverse regions of Australia are, of course, the Great Barrier Reef in my home state and our tropical rainforests. And yet overpopulation and the associated effects of climate change and escalating mining and urban activities are threatening the natural values of those areas. Now, population growth is the first driver in a complex chain of both direct and indirect effects on biodiversity. It really does underpin and exacerbate every other threat to our ecological life support systems. Now, while ex uh, extinction of species has occurred in different forms over millennia, it is the scale and the rate of extinction that is so alarming. Globally, we've lost 30% of our species in the last 40 years. That's just mind-boggling. There's probably species that we, do, we don't even know that we lost. And during that same 40-year period, we've experienced exponential population growth. Until last year, Australia's population growth rate was almost double the world's growth rate, at 2.1 per cent. Um, now, last year, we dropped back to about 1.5 per cent, but consider that in the 1950s, we were a nation of 8 million people. Currently, we're almost triple that, and by 2050, the statisticians project that we'll reach 36 million. Now, our dry country, our finite natural resources, and our dwindling biodiversity simply cannot sustainably support that amount. And such a swelling of our numbers would see an enormous toll on our wildlife and our ecosystems. And they support us. We need them for our very existence. But I think it's really important to stress that we can't blame population growth alone on our environmental impacts. It's the way we live, as well as our sheer numbers, that determines our footprint. And it would be inequitable and very wrong for us to say, here in wealthy Australia, uh, leading our wasteful, profligate lifestyles, that we, we need to call for population stabilisation without addressing our consumption rates. 
So here in wealthy, healthy and safe Australia, we certainly need a sustainable population, but we desperately need to reduce our consumption rates. Or based on current trends, our planet will perish. The, the 2020 WWF Living Planet Report found that globally we're currently using the equivalent of one and a half planets to support our activities. Uh, and based on business as usual projections, that we'd need two planets by 2030 to support our annual needs. Uh, now, I haven't found that second Earth yet, and uh, I don't think anyone else has yet. So we must address our consumption as well as our sheer numbers. And yet global population and consumption both continue to grow rapidly. A growing population makes it harder to address overconsumption, and certainly at the city scale level. For example, a city with a stable population can focus on improving, say, the quality of, exi of existing housing stock and replacing unsustainable energy and water infrastructure with more modern, more efficient infrastructure. A city with a rapidly growing population, however, inevitably expends much of its planning and investment focus on housing and infrastructure to accommodate the increased numbers. A stable city can contemplate restoring degraded or previously developed areas for biodiversity corridors. But a growing city does well to avoid habitat loss, and certainly we've done very poorly in that regard in Queensland. So the link between population growth and threats to Australia's ecosystems is clear. Uh, intergenerational equity, thank you, not to mention interspecies equity, demands that we not accept unsustainable population growth as inevitable. The capacity of our planet and the equitable distribution of its resources must underpin this planet's sustainable population level instead of a blind commitment to growth at all costs, because the cost surely will mean that we will perish. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> Can we hear now, please, from Wayne Goss, the second speaker for the negative. Ladies and gentlemen, because you are a sophisticated audience, our team has decided that we will not be offering bribes in the form of free books, <laughs> nor will we be trying to scare the pants off you with predictions about the end of the planet. We think that the policy debate should be lifted to a higher level. So what I think I need to do is to reframe the issue. If Australia doesn't increase its population, do you know what will happen? We'll get older. We'll get less productive. We'll lose our spark. And do you know what happens after you age and get greyer and greyer and greyer? You perish. Think about it. So population increase is fundamental to a better and a stronger Australia. We need, however, to be smart about the quantity and the quality of that population increase. Now, our opponents, they probably won't admit to it tonight, but some of our opponents in this argument say that Australia has a carrying capacity of 10 to 12 million. Now, I don't have to tell you what that means. It means half of you in the audience have got to go. <laughs> um, maybe their next speaker will tell you which half. <laughs> but when I, say, when I say a better future, a better and stronger Australia, I mean economically, obviously, from the business community perspective, but also in terms of us as committed Australians, socially and culturally as well. But I want to add something to that. And that is the spark, the edge, that comes from new blood, new ideas, new energy. And we can't afford to be complacent. We can't afford to be complacent and assume that's where we're going. Asia has always been regarded as a place that has a competitive advantage because of cheap labour. But research and development, innovation, is just powering through Asia. And not just Asian companies, Fortune 500 companies. Everything from cheap water supply to distant farming communities to ECGs done out of a backpack. It's happening. So what does Australia have to do? There's only one course for us. 
and that is to invest in our intellectual capital. Invest in our intellectual capital. Up the food chain, up the value chain. That's what we should be doing for this country and for the next generation. And what does that mean? It means we've got to invest in education, and in particular, in our universities. Our major universities need to be funded so that they can keep their rankings in the world, so they can attract the best staff, so they can attract the best students. We need to be increasing the skill level in the community. That's about participation and productivity, both worthwhile goals. We also need to be looking to do more research. And as I said before, that spark, that spark. And ladies and gentlemen, we've got to do that to maintain our standard of living. Forget about lifting it, to maintain our standard of living. That's the challenge in a globally competitive world. Now, the other thing that's going to happen this year, 2011 is a big year. This is the year when the baby boomers start to retire. They turn 65 this year. And as that demographic bulge retires over the next 20 years, what are the consequences of that? Firstly, lower economic growth. Secondly, a lower standard of living. Lesser quality of life for retirees on a whole range of fronts, but look at health in particular. And importantly for the next generation, higher taxes, because there will be a proportionally lower ratio of workers to retirees in the workforce. And as well as that, of course, as we get older, we get duller. That spark, we've got to remember that spark. Now, we are in the next phase of the resources boom, as you know. We don't have the workforce, we don't have the skilled workforce to realise the benefits of that resources boom. Now, there are good things happening. There are good things happening in terms of skilled migration, in terms of lifting the skills of our current workforce, in terms of providing training to people who are on welfare, welfare who can work and want to work, they're all good. But we've got to stay the course. We've got to stay the course on that. And while you may think I'm talking about the resources boom, I'm talking about the resources boom in the short term. In the long term, what that builds is a better and stronger Australia. What are the results of lower migration? What are the results of lower migration combined with a strong economy, strong dollar? Well, you know what it is. It's higher wages in some sectors, sectors and higher inflation. Shame on you. <laughs> but the benefits, the benefits of higher migration, and we're talking on our side of you know, what's happening at the moment, about 170, 180,000, the benefits are, and all the studies show this, higher wages. They earn higher wages, which of course means they pay higher taxes. In addition to that, there's a lower age profile. And as well as that, and I know it's hard to model, but Steve might tell us whether you can model it or not, the edge, the edge, the spark that comes from new blood, new energy, new ideas should never underrate that in terms of the contribution that can make economically, socially and culturally to Australia. Now, many, many years ago, in fact, in another century, I used to be somebody. <laughs> and one of the things I was involved in in those days was COAG, the Council of Australian Governments. We actually achieved one or two things. But the reason we achieved one or two things is because you had a group of leaders who were prepared to work across levels of government and across party political allegiances to say, what's the right policy? What's the goal that we should have as a country? And find a way to get there. That's about hard decisions, but smart policy is the way to address hard decisions. Now, I know that for people like our opponents and shock jocks, when you're sitting in the traffic, it's very easy to get you cheesed off about a greater population. But a sophisticated audience like this not only cares about... It's true, isn't it? <laughs> not only cares about quality of life and the environment... <laughs> a sign of desperation, friends, a sign of desperation. 
They also believe that here is an opportunity for this country, that Australians should be positive about this country, we should be positive about the future, and that with smart policies, smart policies, we can get there. Now, by the way, I just want to interrupt for a second to say they never say where the half of you who have to leave will have to go. Now, it won't be north, because that's pretty crowded already. That means they're sending you to New Zealand. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with New Zealand, but think about it. Friends, Australia has a great opportunity. Let's seize it. I welcome now the third speaker for the affirmative, Steve Keane. Well, you're not just sophisticated. Pardon me for laryngitis yet again in my second IQ debate, my second dose of laryngitis in 10 years. You're not just a sophisticated audience, you're a very peculiar one. Look around. You're re there's something really strange about this audience. Can you tell? You're all bipedal monkeys. There's not a single quadruped, no kangaroos and even though we're in Australia, not even in any knuckle-dragging monkeys in the audience, which is pretty strange because we're supposed to be counting, talking about the world's population. But what we mean by population isn't the entire planet's number of living animals, or even living plants. We mean the number of the bipedal monkeys. So by rising population, what we're really saying is that we're wondering whether the population of bipedal monkeys can keep on rising forever. Now, if we could actually get some of the other animals in the room, they would say, well, obviously that's silly because if you keep on populating, you'll wipe out the other species in which you depend and then your population will crash. So to them, it's obvious. Now, of course, it's not obvious to us because what would they know? See, we're smart monkeys. We can dream up all sorts of reasons why the inevitable can't happen. So let me go through some of them. One we've heard uh, to some extent from the uh, other side today is, well, maybe it'll happen, but that's a long way off. The planet's huge, our impact is minuscule. Well, you hear the same thing in the carbon debate, of course, and the shock jocks who talk to our side of the fence all the time, of course, and give us plenty of room to make our case. Um, 20 years ago, one very bright monkey that Lewis has already referred to, William Rees, worked out the idea of a human ecological footprint, which said, how much of the planet can we actually use in a reproductive sense? How many hectares do we have to work with? And how many are we using? And compare the two, and he called the ratio the footprint. And the first one, which is the number of hectares we have to use, standardising for farming and grazing and mining and so on, came out at 12 billion. Now, working back to 1961, we were using 8 billion hectares then. So at that time, 60% of the planet was being used to keep bipedal monkeys happy, and 40% was less for the other species. By 1977, we had the whole 12 billion. So the rest of the species had zero. Now, of course, that didn't mean they disappeared. It meant that we were then for mining the planet's capacity to support the life forms on it. Today, our total is 18 billion hectares. As Larissa said, 1.5 times the planet's capacity. Now that's like living off a bank account off both the principal and the interest. You'll live really well, and the more of the principal you spend now, the better you'll feel, and then you'll die. You can't live off the principal, you must live off the interest for a sustainable system. It's like driving a car, our current behaviour, is like driving a car at 9,000 revs when it red lines at 6,000. I'm sure some ex-teenagers in the audience have done that at various times and had an exciting ride until the engine blows up. Well, that's the sort of future we may face. Now, the second answer to that, and believe me, I hear this one all the time, is technology will save us. Technology, I see, is rather like voodoo dolls, the way it's thought about by people who talk about it without considering it. But technology depends upon a whole range of complex interactions between population, pollution, resource depletion. Can technical change handle all those interactions at once? Now, another group of very smart monkeys some time ago concluded, yes, we can. They said we could have an infinite future of rising living standards if we did a whole range of things, including stabilising human population by the year 2000. That was the Limits to Growth report back in 1972. 
Few things have been as derided by economists, and that to me is an incredible mark of respect for how much the rest of the world should take it seriously. The problem is that technology is seen as a quick fix by those who don't work in technology. Technology is not quick. The inspiration, the spark, may come instantly. But as Edison said a long time ago, it's 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And by the time the perspiration is over, in the crisis we're in, we may be unable to turn it around. Now, for example, I'd love to see a system called SkyTran be brought in for transportation in this city and every other city in the world. It's low cost uh, magnetic levitation transportation that has vehicles traveling at 160 kilometers an hour. If we brought it in, we'd reduce our petrol consumption, our energy consumption for transportation by 90%. But I have a pretty damn good idea of how long it'd take us to bring that system in and the cost involved in doing it at the time. So technology is not a quick fix, and we've already gone past the point where technology can save us. Then the Australia is different argument. We've heard that quite a bit from the other side. Our population is small, our land is so vast, we should do something different. Well, it's true. We are different. Most countries in that measurement of the footprint have got a much bigger footprint than they've got the capacity. The UK, for example, uses three times the resources it actually has. America uses twice, Germany 2.5. We are only using 50%, so we do have room to grow. And there are two other countries just like us, Canada and Sweden. Now, they had two other things in common as well. The footprint per person has been relatively constant for, six, for 40, 50 years. The footprint in Australia and Canada has been about seven hectares per person. Sweden's been six. So it looks like we've stabilised the load per person. Sweden had seven million people in 1945, which we roughly did as well. They now have 9 million. We've gone from 7 to 22. Sweden is degrading its ecological capacity at a much lower rate than ours. They're losing about 0.06 of a hectare per year. And they, if they keep on going as the way they are, they'll join in the deficit countries by the year 2300. How do you reckon we're doing? We're cactus in 25 years. We're degrading our, rate, our, our capacity at about 0.3 hectares a year. Now, people might say, oh, we can consume less then. We can be, you know, do more with less, the old smarter argument. Even if we reduced our footprint by half, and we have one of the biggest footprints on the planet, it would only buy us another 15 years. We'd make it to 2050. So by the time the other side's talking about stabilising population, we'd be facing a degrading environment already ahead of that schedule. Now, the fourth one I really like, and again, we've heard a bit of this from the other side, the analogy about the size of the stage here. It's somebody else's responsibility. The world's crowded, we've got plenty of space. We don't need to do anything. I have a feeling this is going to be seen by whatever's left of a future generation once the planet does shoot past its capacity and does go backwards as the ecological equivalent of the Nuremberg defence. I was only following orders. Only now, it's somebody else's responsibility. It's our responsibility. Thank you. And Tanvir Ahmed, the third speaker for the negative. So a Turkish immigrant once arrived to Sydney airport and was met by a team of journalists. They were waiting on Elizabeth Taylor. By chance, the journalist asked the new arrival what he thought of Australia. Through an interpreter, he wanted to know why it took so long to fly to Austria. <laughs> like many others who arrived in Australia by chance, he chose to stay. My own father faced the decision 30 odd years ago. We are a society that began and progresses without grand design or grand mythology, but partly by default and partly good management has developed into arguably the most diverse an integrated society of the developed world. Now, I've, I've started my speech, I guess, with the idea of immigration. But you may be mistaken when you hear debates about population and the question, what on earth is this debate about? Now, on my side, you've heard, you've heard from sensible peer, people trying to argue coherently about measurable data, focusing on Australia, why managed population can be good for the country. It has been for our entire history. On the other side, you've heard incoherent debates. 
You've heard, I think, ideas that kind of, I guess, lights up the psychiatrist part of me at times. <laughs> You've heard everything linking climate change to News Corp, to locust, to bipedal monkeys. <laughs> You've heard that not only if within a rising population will you be engulfed with road rage due to infrastructure problems, you also risk the eternal demise of Blinky Bill and his brethren. <laughs> You've heard all these, all these linkages. And this is where in, uh, the debate of population has occurred throughout human history. And it essentially underlies deeper prejudices or underlying beliefs. On our side, we are arguing that we're not dramatically trying to reinvent the wheel of civilization. That the way we live now is not completely unreasonable. And based on that, we will attempt to manage population. On the other side, it is essentially an anti-human argument. First started, I guess, a, a reincarnation of Malthus, that people in general are the scourge of the earth. And that you're also hearing arguments about how we should fundamentally live. So an anti-growth argument. So these are the deeper prejudices. So we essentially differ virtually in what we're debating tonight. But for the purpose of this debate, I will stick to our slightly more coherent debate and focus a little bit more on migration. And I guess the biggest thing we barely debated today is birth rate. And again, it underlies the fundamental prejudices. Part of the reason birth rate if it, uh, is rarely discussed, because it would openly be challenging your children, grandchildren, not to procreate. And let's see how that runs down. So fundamental human uh, uh, biology, if you like. So these are the underlying prejudices. But let me for a moment focus on migration. Since Federation, there have been moves to curb immigration from the labour movement worried about cheap labour, threatening unskilled workers, from groups worried about social cohesion, and from geographers and environmental groups expressing their concerns about the carrying capacity of our parched continent. Immigration is not a fundamental expectation ingrained into our psyche, it's perhaps like the United States, and I think fears of it are deeply rooted in our national identity. But each of these fears, and if you take a poll in the last 50, 60 years, every time the populace will, uh, 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 the majority will argue against immigration. Yet we've had absolutely tremendous immigration and it's, and it's formed, the, I guess, one of the real fundamental pillars of our society. So this is, I guess, a typical populist reaction that's always existed. And they've largely been disproved each time because we manage our migration very well. And we heard an argument from the senator talking about we should, it's very easy to go, uh, uh, I guess, try for compassion one-upmanship and demand that we should limit our skilled migration as opposed to increasing our refugee intake when in fact we already have the highest per capita refugee intake in the uh, developed world. And those of us who actually work closely with refugees will know that refugees require far greater resources. They have much higher rates of unemployment, much higher rates of welfare, that is fact. So it requires significantly uh, more management. And we should be proud of our intake, but it's not as simple as taking, waving the compassion flag and say, let's just take more. And it illustrates again some of the naive populist arguments of our opponents. While initial waves of post-war migration comprised of relatively unskilled and helped in massive infrastructure schemes, recent decades have focused on employer-driven skilled labour. Their needs have driven our economy further, enriched the culture and fabric of our nation, and their children are, by and large, through their disproportionate drive and entrepreneurialism, even more successful, rising to the highest levels of our professional and managerial classes. And this is really what I want to focus on. And you've heard it to an extent from my teammates. And this is what's most critical for our rising population, that the diversity, dynamism, and constant regeneration, which is actually the most difficult to model on economist models, including the Productivity Commission, and usually they don't even bother trying. This, this is actually the key and least discussed contributor of our immigration, driving the greater pool of ideas, particularly in the 21st century when knowledge societies will be critical. 
And this is also why the tired accusation that it's only property developers and business groups who want immigration is poorly based. Population growth, given appropriate institutions and incentives, not only contributes positively productivity and rising living standards, it is the main driver of these improvements in the long run. The perspective is difficult to measure, it's counterintuitive. It's very simple intuition to think more people, more resources, etc. but it's also simplistic because in the short-term resource constraints lead to long-term abundance. That is counterintuitive, but that is the reality. It's the mind that matters most economically, far more than mouths or hands. The most important economic effect of population size and growth is the contribution of additional people to our stock of useful knowledge. And this alone is large enough in the, in the long run to overcome all the costs of population growth. Now it may appear, and you've heard from my teammates, that the environmental argument is a new one. But this is actually almost uniquely strong in Australian history, right from Griffith Taylor, who coined the term carrying capacity and said we couldn't hold more than 20 million people, to modern incarnations like Tim Flannery. It's been particularly powerful in Australia and is ultimately Malthusian, which has repeatedly been disproved, but there are always modern reincarnations, a la Dick, Dick Smith. <laughs> now, faster growing population will require investment in housing and infrastructure. It will also be younger and better able to meet these needs. A more slowly growing one requires fewer investments in housing, roads and schools, but will be significantly older, and the, with a, which means the cost of healthcare and pensions will rise while the tax base falls. So don't blame immigrants what is often related to poor management in terms of water shortage or town planning. It's also far easier to provide mass transit when you have cities of higher density, not to mention the cities with mass transit and apartment living leave a much lower carbon footprint. Now, given I'm running out of time, I'll just go towards the end. Now, in maintaining our immigration, we may lack, lack the bells and whistles of the US and certainly the innate resistance to integrate migrants present in parts of Europe, but our nation has been built on immigration. Now, you, you, many of you will be familiar with the Statue of Liberty quote, quote you know, give us your uh, tired, your poor, the teeming refuse of your wretched shore. In Australia, it may be called, you know, give us your skilled migrants who we will treasure and some refos and relos for good measure. <laughs> in attempting to uh, halt or drastically limit immigration, in Geoffrey Blaney's words, I think we risk a new tyranny of distance. But this distance will be economic, cultural and intellectual. So do not buy into our opponents' debates. Rising population is in fact the critical requirement for Australia's future. If I would have written a book, I would have written everything what Dick Smith has written. Although I found a little blunder on page 133, <laughs> National Geographic uh, June 2011 told me that uh, 108 billion uh, people have lived on Earth uh, during uh, human history. Anyway, but I think nobody during the discussion went to the very root of the problem. Reading the sentence on page 143, Just make more, it faster. Yeah, more than a billion children born in the next 40 years will be condemned to a life of poverty and inequality made me think again, and it always has puzzled me. How on earth did nobody have the decency to ask me if I actually wanted to be born? Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, please. Uh, I just want to say that I'm getting a little tired of the old ageing problem. Uh, being an ageing person, um, I'm really very annoyed with the whole issue and I wonder what kind of paradigms people are using when they say 65 is the limit for ageing. Uh, today I was working with a woman who was 80 and who has just renegotiated her contract for another three years at her place of employment. I think it's very short vision to say that the problem is ageing. If you look at what the ageing people do in this country, they are giving blood, they are volunteering, they are helping the country thrive and survive. And that's all I have to say. And Dick Smith, if you'd like to donate a book to the senior agenda, we'd love to have one. 
I'll, I'll come up here to mic three, please. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Anthony Petrolo. I'm supporting the people who are uh, for the motion. I have a question directed to the panellists against the motion. Um, in recent times, we're seeing a lot more uh, technology in our modern society, more technology which is replacing services, and we're seeing, um, in especially really recent times, we're seeing a lack in um, uh, confidence in regards to spending. Now, one point I'd like to make is a comment from Tim Jackson, who says that economic growth cannot keep growing on a planet with finite resources. Now, based on the two points I've made, how can you support that, the idea of constantly growing the population when we're seeing services being cut and when, as Tim Jackson acknowledged, our resources are finite? Thank you. I might take that on, does, do you want to answer that, Wayne? Um, it's a very valid question and I think a lot of people have that question in their own minds, but the challenge for Australia is we have to overcome these issues and we're talking about 35, 36 million. And we believe, we believe that Australia can cope with such a population. We've got a lot of smart people in this country. Those challenges can and will be addressed. I've got no doubt about that. Question, uh, Mike Four, please. Yes, good evening. My name is Nathan. I am a conservative. I sincerely hope that I'm not alone in the room. Now, conservative, by definition, means wishing to conserve. And I see two luminaries of the left participating in the debate this evening, and I feel embarrassed. And therefore, my suggestion is that the only way we're going to get movement on this subject is if this becomes a far more mainstream issue than has hitherto been the case. I'm embarrassed that the conservative side of politics doesn't have a population policy and we should. Moreover, that policy should fix a number and should work towards its implementation. Mr Goss, you said that one of the reasons that we needed to have a greater population was to cope with the resources boom. I would like to know how adding an extra million or two to the outer suburban fringes of Sydney, Melbourne or Brisbane will put 10 or 15,000 extra people on the ground in the Pilbara or off the northwest shelf to help participate in that resources boom. And Mr Brennan, you've used an analogy of the burgeoning room and the comparatively sparsely populated stage. In Somalia, as we speak, there is an unprecedented humanitarian crisis occurring as famine grips that land, but they have 7.2 children each. Are you suggesting that we should share in that fate? Thank you. Thank you. Now, do we have... By my reckoning, we have had three questions for the, in support of the motion. We've had one against. Uh, is, are there any against, just to try to even it up? Anybody against them? Yes, would you mind? Just, I'll just let that lady, thank you. Hi, I'm Jasmine. I'm a, um, I feel concerned about the way in which the debate has happened because it disconnects uh, from consumption. So. I'm a, 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 arguably with a very small population, Australia man Australians managed to ruin our topsoil. So I, because we had policies that said we had to clear the land, for example. And so what I, um, I am interested in from the um, uh, four group is how will reducing population to 20 million actually curb the consumption and the kinds of ways in which people expand. And I, I will just point out that the uh, house size per Australian household in New South Wales has doubled within eight years. Uh, and I, I, um, as people have fewer people, they have more yeah. bedrooms or bathrooms. It's curious. Conundrums. Um, Steve, do you want to take that up? Topsoil. My hearing is bad, by the way. I might mishear your question, but topsoil depletion is uh, one of these remarkable things that pe people 
you all have to be an expert in the area to actually know what's going on. I met one a couple of months ago and he told me that on current calculations, uh, this won't be sustained, of course, because that'd be the end of human civilization. But at current rate of depletion on a planetary scale, we've got about 25 years of topsoil left. We were talked about Queensland, the growth in Queensland. We saw the floods in Queensland last year as well. And saw the topsoil rushing off into the barrier reef. But Steve, reef. the question was the yeah. conundrum of the fewer people, yeah. bigger houses, more consumption. Contradictory. Oh, the, the, the whole, the whole, the, yeah, getting into McMansion territory is one of the things that caused our problem. But ironically, as I said, our footprint's been rather con constant over the last 40 years. We've done more wasteful things, we've done them more efficiently. So therefore, we've maintained our burden on the planet. And we have to do two things. We've got to reduce that burden per head, and we've got to keep our numbers constrained. And unfortunately, every last calculation you look at to say, can we do it by consuming less and let population grow, or by faster technology and let population grow, the answer is always no. Unless we stabilise that as well, then doing the other things won't be enough. Could I have Mike Five, please, at the top? Hi, good evening. My name's Donny McClurkin. I'm from the Post Growth Institute. My question to the negative tonight is, the rate of global population growth is actually decreasing. Systems of economic growth are based on an ever-increasing population. So when does the, do the members of the affirmative suggest that we start planning different economic systems that don't rely on ever-increasing populations and growth? Yes, Dick. Yes, I can answer. I can answer that, and um, unfortunately in nine minutes I can't cover the research I've done, but uh, I believe as a capitalist who's benefited greatly from growth that we can have a system of capitalism which is based on sustainability, which will concentrate on growth in quality of life, growth in less working hours, dare I say it, instead of spending so half of the products in a typical shopping centre are just rubbish but we have to keep buying them and making them, otherwise we'll have recession. Instead of doing that, I believe we can change our economy so we have capitalism, but we're thriving in a different way. But you're not going to do that. Growth is such an easy way of making money that you're not going to do that until you get some leadership. One of the other contributors mentioned that it needs to become mainstream, and maybe in my two-minute closing bit I will mention why it hasn't become mainstream in Australia. Mark one, please. Go forth and multiply. We've done that, and now the paradigm needs to be sharing and planning so that we can share. Since my parents were born, the human population has quadrupled. It's a different world now. We need to give women especially the chance to manage their lives and fertility. Only one of these people has mentioned contraception, which needs to be central to this debate. Now, I work for a foundation. We raise funds for a contraception component in overseas aid. There are women who need to be able to delay having childbearing until their bones are formed and who need to be able to finish before that last pregnancy, which is a killer. If you look at climate change, to save one tonne of carbon dioxide, you can spend four British pounds, this is British research, on contraception. That would equal eight pounds spent on tree planting, 15 pounds spent on wind power, 31 pounds on solar generation. We need to do it all. We need to look at climate change, every measure we can, but especially we need to see that contraception is something we can talk about and make available around the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Microphone two. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I uh, feel guilty on two counts. One is I bought the big tilt and I really enjoyed it. I'm um, sorry, Dick. But I'll get your book and, uh, and I'll try and remedy that after hearing you tonight. I certainly will. And the other is, uh, I'm sorry to be, uh, have breached the point where my spark has got a bit dimmer because of Mr. Goss. I mean, are you sure you're not just... <laughs> you sure that just doesn't happen in Queensland? <laughs> not from but what the, I've seen the, in Sydney. The, the, two things, the two things that are missing in terms of mention, in terms of population growth, this is a deliberately ambiguous question, so whatever polling you do is not going to really reflect anything. But 
the, but the, the point is you, the growth is happening in the Middle East. Is that where women are going to be educated and how quickly is it going to happen? Because you look at the statistics, it's all happening around the Horn of Africa and the Middle East. I mean, the numbers are really, really amazing how different it is in the world. And people ought to concentrate on just what are the cultural aspects which enable that to continue. China has not been mentioned. I mean, with, the, with these amazing distortions that are happening in their society with the one child per family and, of course, a lot of uh, uh, infanticide. I mean, it's an amazing phenomenon that we haven't even in this debate mentioned what China has done Thank in this world. Thank you. Uh, uh, can we take that just on notice? I think, I think it's just a... Yes, please, microphone three. Can dumb monkeys have dreams or are they dumb because they have dreams? I just, in summary, I really think that Australia, in my view, as an engineer, I hope I'm not a dumb monkey, but I do dream, I think Australia could support 200 million people without any trouble. And I know everybody will boo this, but the point is not one engineer has been asked, could it be done? Now, it is, uh, it is most gratifying that Dick Smith and Wayne Goss have been the people who have indicated how wonderfully human beings can apply technology. We have a responsibility as dumb monkeys or smart monkeys or human beings. Are we going to ask the question, is a koala more important than a refugee child fleeing from an intolerable dictatorship where no amount of argy-bargy military action or foreign aid will help that child other than bringing it to Australia or a country like Australia. Thank you, sir. Right. Now, I'm going to just go... Is that a, is microphone six, just because we haven't had been up there? Thanks. Uh, William Burke from the Stable Population Party. Um, quick question for Senator Waters. Uh, with regard to the Greens uh, population policy, does it um, mention the baby bonus? And the second uh, question is with regard to the uh, against team. Um, there was constant assertions that immigration makes Australia younger. Are they aware that uh, one in ten Australian born are over 65, yet uh, two in ten uh, overseas born Australians are over 65? Do you wish to follow through or will I keep going? I don't think... I can only speak for myself and say I'm not aware. <laughs> yes, sir, down here is number one. Oh, actually, Larissa would just like to respond, yes. Yeah, this is Odie's working. Yeah, thank you for that, William. Uh, as you know, we were really pleased that the baby bonus doesn't exist anymore and it's now paid parental leave. It's a valid payment, a fortnightly means-tested payment to help with the cost of a new baby and we think that's absolutely fabulous. So I think we're on the same page there. Yes, sir. My name is Chris Spike from Sustainable Population Australia. <laughs> I'd like to um, pick up something that Wayne Goss said uh, about 2011 being an important year with the baby boomers starting to retire. Another important year turns out to be 2008, which is widely being regarded as the year of peak oil. It's a di difficult thing to uh, estimate, but that's where it's looking like the peak of oil production is in 2008. And our oil supplies are expected to start dwindling from here. I'd like to look a bit further into the future than 2050, maybe towards the end of the century, when our oil supplies are almost completely exhausted and uh, think about that situation combined with climate change and how that might affect our ability to provide food. You said that um, you felt that Australians should be positive about the future. Are you positive there'll be enough food at the end of the century to feed all Australians? Absolutely. Okay, yes please, number two. Kate Caro, representing nobody. Um, <laughs> um, as a migrant, I feel I can't argue against immigration. As a mother of four, I feel I can't criticize people who want children. Um, as a historian, I'd like to draw attention uh, to Malthus, who's already been uh, 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 referred to, and to Ehrlich, 
both of whom predicted doom very shortly to follow. Uh, neither of these disasters took place. And in both cases, technology, the human ingenuity, solved the problem. Um, I hope it will again. And it seems to me, though, that uh, prosperity reduces reproduction. Prosperous societies generally don't replace themselves. Um, so I think we should be concentrating far more than we do on helping to create prosperity in, the, in those places where ch children, seven, eight, nine children, half of whom may die but still increasing the population too quickly, are born in order to support their parents in their old age. Um, that is where our attention should be going, rather than trying to undertake what seems to me the impossible task of reducing global population, even stabilizing global population, short of World War III. Thank you. And I think we'll just give our questioner, final quick uh, question number five, uh, Mark Five. Um, hi there, my name is Kirsty. I'm a medical scientist. I just wanted to reply to the engineer. Um, you may be able to build housing for 200 million people, billion people, but those people need to drink water and they need nutriment. And in a vastly arid country, which is our continent, um, we have already seen the effects of small droughts. And in the future, how is that possible without water and nutriment? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I think they do certainly give us a very good indication of a range of attitudes, which maybe our speakers will uh, uh, draw into their final remarks. Now I'm going to ask you to vote. And we're going to pass along the voting boxes. And I will ask you to be prompt with those, because we move this along very fast now. Now, though, if you notice, remember the question is, if we keep populating, we will perish. So if you agree with that, you're voting for the motion and you tear your ticket in half and put it in the box. If you do not agree, uh, then you're voting against the motion, and similarly, you, put the, you tear the ticket in half, put it in the box. If you're undecided, you effectively you put the whole ticket in the box to indicate that you, you don't wish to uh, vote. You, you are effectively abstaining. Now, while you're all pondering what I think will be a very interesting set of decisions, I'm going to ask our speakers to just remain in their chairs to make two-minute closing remarks. Uh, so, Dick Smith, would you like to kick us off, please? Oh, yes, certainly. It's fascinating to me that the other side, the furthest they ever got was 2050 and 35 to 36 million people, because they just can't cover the fact that exponential growth is exponential growth and it's endless. So basically what they're saying is, well, we'll let another generation solve the problem. The other thing is a person from the audience asked about it becoming mainstream. And I must tell you one of the reasons for the failure in the book, because it's most apt to this particular thing. First of all, Bob Carr says the book is well written. One of the reasons it's well written is Simon Nasht, who's one of our best writers in Australia, worked with me on that book. But the, one of the main reasons it's failed is most people don't know it exists. And I knew the Murdoch press wouldn't cover it. That was well known. But people said to me, Dick, you'll find the ABC will basically never mention it. And I want to bring this out because it's important for Australians. Um, the Q&A have besieged me during my lifetime. When will I go on Q&A? And I always said, well, one day when I have something worthwhile to say. And when the book was written, which covers some really interesting information as a capitalist about how we can have a stable system, we've been in touch with them many times, and I understand there's a fatwa at the ABC that, in effect, they are so pro-growth, and you only have to watch Alan Kohler on the ABC each night with the pro-growth, grow-growth. His voice actually goes up an octave when he talks of growth and down. <laughs> and what's amazing is that a couple of weeks ago, the 7.30 report rang up and said, would I go on a panel discussion with Ziggy Sikorsky and Jeff Cousins. And I thought, wow, this is a breakthrough. Uh, they've invited me on. So I rearranged everything. But the afternoon of the panel discussion, they rang up and said, oh, we've decided that we don't want you. And so 
all I want to say to you is the ABC is letting us down here. Whether it's because they're just so addicted to what we've had, which is growth, whether it's because so many of them have investments and want to keep the growth going, I don't know what it is, but it's a real disappointment. They should cover some of the important issues which I put in my book, which basically say <laughs> we can actually have prosperity without growth. Thank you. Now I know why Simon left this to me, you see. <laughs> Rushed off to Singapore. I will neither confirm nor deny any of this. Frank Brennan, would you care to make two minutes of closing remark, please? So you've heard it here, the world population crisis is an elaborate conspiracy of the ABC. <laughs> the one consolation I can offer Dick is that if you look at history, Dick, we've heard about Malthus, his 19th century tome, it went to six editions even though it was completely wrong. So, <laughs> so far, there may be hope. So far. If we think about the situation of the globe, that is the overflowing auditorium, the situation in Somalia, which Conservative Nathan rose for us at microphone four, 7.2 children per woman. I'll accept that statistic. The latest UN survey shows that if you were to look at the lowest possible variant that they can predict, Yes, population will peak at 2050, about 8.1 billion, and it could then decline to 6.2 billion by 2100. It won't be as a result of just handing out contraceptives. It will be about the education, the dignity, the work employment of women, particularly in the 39 countries of Africa most affected. In terms of the situation on stage, I'm sorry to say to those of you who get upset about the aged, that longevity is an issue. By 2050, those born who are male will live till 85. Those who are female will live till 88. Our fertility rates are not going to increase. So the question is going to be, what we do about our migration levels in order to deal with that situation? Do we maintain what we have or not? Ultimately, this is not going to be a decision saying that if we maintain population, we increase our materialism. No, not at all. If we maintain our population responsibly, we will question the materialism which we presently enjoy. And that's the great moral challenge of the age. Thank you. Larissa. Thanks, Geraldine. Well, look, we only have one planet. And if we don't live within its ecological limits, then we will cease to exist. And I was really pleased that one of the questioners raised the issue of food, because coming from Queensland, we're putting coal seam gas mines and open cut coal mines on some of our best food producing land. Now, I think nationally, we've only got about 4% of Australia that's considered able to produce food. So we need to be doing all we can to protect that. And with the growing world population, and we currently are net exporters of food, we've got an obligation to feed the world as well as feeding ourselves. So thank you to the questioner for raising that point. Of course, we've got alternatives for energy, but we don't have alternatives for food. Um, we really need an equitable distribution of resources. And so I think it's great that the issue of consumption and materialism has been raised by a few speakers tonight. That's a really important one. Us as rich, wealthy, happy, safe people, we've got an obligation to make sure that our lifestyle isn't coming at the expense of others. Um, but we can have prosperity without growth. Now, a few people mentioned Tim Jackson, and uh, Dick, you referred to that as well. It is a no-brainer. We can have prosperity without growth. We've got to get off this growth treadmill because we're on one planet. It's finite. We can't just make it up as we go along. We've got to live within those limits. Uh, and just to finish on that, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. Wayne Goss. I first wanted to address the point that uh, one of the questioners raised about aged people being a problem. I didn't want to imply that. My mother is 82 and she's firing on all cylinders. But it's important in terms of people who deal in public policy because all the research shows that when you get a demographic bulge like the baby boomer generation retiring, economic growth slows. That means a lesser standard of living, and importantly, for older people who we should support and respect, 
it means that there is a risk in terms of their standard of living and costs such as health because there is a lower proportional ratio in terms of workers to people who are retired. Aged people should be supported and respected, but we've got an important public policy challenge. Now, some people think that this debate, people from our side, it's about bigger is better. Well, that might apply in another debate that would be much more interesting than this one. But a sophisticated audience knows that it's not about bigger is better, it's about quality. And that's why I spoke before about smart policies in terms of the quantity and the quality of our debate. Australia does face challenges, but we've got a lot of smart people. So let's be positive and realise the potential that is within our grasp. Thank you, Wayne. And for closing remarks, for the four sides, Stephen Keane. Um, I think we have to send a, a sympathy note to Germany because obviously they've got a serious problem with their pensions and they must be starving over there because with a stable population, they must have a huge age burden and therefore they can't possibly be productive. See the logical flaw? The argument we need a certain ratio of productive people, you know, youthful to old, and other we don't have that, we're going to have declining uh, welfare coming out of it, is a recipe for super exponential growth because you need a large birth rate to maintain that ratio. Now, Germany doesn't have that large growth rate. It has a strong focus upon productivity. And that productivity growth is what gives them their level of wealth, and they can handle that with a much smaller level of so-called productive age people than we do. So we've been led a, a fallacy that way. I made the comparison with Sweden, having 7 million people in 1945, 9 million people now. We've got, we've done from 7 to 22 million. We have roughly the same GDP per head. And I think they've been rather more successful in industrial exports and getting a technological profile than we have. And speaking of somebody working in the university sector, we have got far much, too large, too large a focus, and never mind the quality, fill the width. It's sheer numbers. You need to have, for specialisation, you need to have a lower rate of growth of that population so you can actually do some decent research and some decent teaching. And Tanvir Ahmed, summing up for the negative. Sure. Um, history is a flow of ideas. What we're hearing from our opponents is essentially a rehash of a kind of uh, green Marxism, that we, we will organise how to live, we will tell you how to live. The beauty of our system is that individuals make decisions how to live, and those collective decisions essentially build far more prosperous and dynamic societies. Just simple things. We're not automatons going, producing and consuming. While the superficiality of market liberalism may appear like that, anyone who travels around the world will see that underlying that is improved infant mortality, better life expectancy, better education, the fundamentals of, of improving human life. And economic growth, liberal market economies have done this better than any other system. I do not see what their sustainable economy exactly is yet. I would love to see the picture of that. Uh, so, and just, uh, just a broader things like, okay, global, we're not, I'm not quite sure, sometimes we're debating global population versus Australian population. Simple thing. We bring someone here, they reproduce less, they send money back home. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good contribution to global poverty. The conservative man over there talking, again, a liberal society, we can't plan. It's very difficult to plan demographics. People do not choose to come here if it's a crap place to live and there are no jobs. Hence, it's a dynamic system. That isn't easily planned. But government policy can still drive benefits to the broader Australian population. It can be managed. And that's what we're proposing. Thank you, Tanvir. Well, now we get to the very exciting part of pe people beavering away out the back, uh, assessing all the votes. We have quite an interesting system here. I know many of you have been here before. In a way, there are two ways of judging who wins this debate. There is the simple majority of the, of the side that gets over 50%. But there is another way, uh, as you, many of you will have been asked, for your indicative attitudes as you walked in the door. We don't get everybody, it's not absolutely scientific, 
But in other words, people come along to debates like this with preconceived ideas, that's what brings you out, and we are always fascinated to see how much people's ideas have shifted during the course of the debate. So have the speakers altered your views? And uh, so we'll, we'll see whether there has been, when, when the numbers are brought out to me, we'll compare and contrast from the indicative answers as to whether there has been a big shift or not. We just have a couple of tweets while I'll keep you hanging. Um, I wonder if, with no interference, Australia would stabilise and go to negative population growth due to low birth rates. And another tweet, the current system is designed for unlimited growth, probably not useful to portray it as an addiction or a fetish. Goss tries to scare us with the threat of retired baby boomers, exclamation. Funny thing is, though, they just keep working. So, higher wages, more innovation, less inflation, and all for the low price of dying from overpopulation. And maybe our last one. The elephants in the room, peak oil, China's demographics, and Middle East growth are raised from the floor. Maybe one more. How, has anyone mentioned how life is more interesting when you have more people in a concentrated space? Okay. So here was the, um, actually just, just before, one more, because I do want to mention the next debate here in this great series, the IQ2 uh, debates, which have just been so successful. It's on September the 6th, Atheists Are Wrong. Uh, I'm going to very much turn up for this. Our speakers, a great lineup, the Reverend, Most Reverend Peter Jensen, uh, the Sydney Anglican Archbishop, Dr. Tracy Rowland from John Paul II Institute, and Scott Stevens, who runs the Religion and Ethics website very well, I think, for ABC Online. They will be speaking for the notion that atheists are wrong. And against the notion will be Jane Caro, who I think many of you may know, a very prominent commentator, runs her own communications uh, consultancy. Dr. Thomas Pataki, uh, an honorary senior fellow at the University of Melbourne, uh, in uh, the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies, and Russell Blackford, uh, a sci-fi author, a very prominent atheist, and a wonderful speaker. He's uh, a lecturer at the University of Newcastle. So don't forget, put in your diary, September the 6th. <laughs> no, you're not invited to this. You've done your bit. Um, and <laughs> um, Always wait, want to do that, Frank Brennan. Uh, and um, <laughs> one extra debate by Sydney Ideas in the Great Hall uh, at Sydney University on Tuesday the 16th of August. We need a nanny state. So lots of lovely uh, debates coming up if you choose to, uh, to go. Thank you very much indeed, Frank, thanks. Now, the pre-debate poll, if we keep populating, we will perish. Four were uh, 358, 41.5% against 178, 20.6%, and undecideds, 32%, 30, 327, pardon me, 37.9. So there was 41 in favour, 20% against, undecided, 37.9, 38%. The final result, the final result is interesting. <laughs> the for the motion, if we keep populating, we will perish, 63%, 521. Against, 212, 26%, some movement. Undecided, 89. In other words, 11%. So I have to absolutely give the result to my colleagues in favour of the motion, if we keep populating, we will perish. This is Big Ideas from the ABC.